Just a few blocks from the Capitol Building in Washington, D.C., is the annual event Hold Their Feet to the Fire, sponsored by the Federation for American Immigration Reform, bringing talk radio hosts and others together from across the country, talking with people about what's really going on in the area of immigration and the deception, frankly, that's being practiced by too many politicians trying to fool the American people about what's going on and of course, you cannot talk about immigration and illegal immigration in the melting pot of America without talking about the English language. And you know, as the grandson of immigrants, my father's parents were immigrants from Hungary. And uh, you know, I tell people I am by blood half Hungarian. In fact, they came from the region uh, in Hungary, which is now part of Romania, but it's from Transylvania. I am by blood half Transylvanian, and I'm proud of that fact. But I'm, I may be half Hungarian, but I'm all American, and that's the part that really counts. And uh, no, I don't speak Hungarian, but I absolutely speak English. And I wish that English were the language of America because it's the language that enables people to succeed. If you have people coming from different nations, how are they going to talk to each other? Do we want a Tower of Babel society where people cannot communicate with each other? How are they going to be able to get along? How are they going to be able to trade? How are they going to be able to understand each other if they're separated by different languages? Well, that's why there's an organization such as Pro-English. And joining me is the Executive Director of Pro-English, Bob Vandervoort. Bob, welcome. Good to have you on the program. Good to have you at this conference. Well, thanks, Ernest. It's great to be here. Now, why don't, you, why don't you tell people something about Pro-English and what your objectives are? Sure. Well, Pro-English has been around for 20 years, and we basically are an English language advocates. And our primary goal is to make English the official language for the federal government, for government purposes. And we also work at the state and local level to pass English language ordinances. And that has been an objective that has been supported by the vast majority of the American people for many, many, many years. That's true. But it doesn't happen. What's the problem? Well, that's a good question. In fact, if uh, your listeners check out our website, proenglish.org, we link to a lot of polls. Polling data shows that the overwhelming majority of Americans support making English our official language. Somewhere between 84, 85, 87 percent, depending on the poll, shows these people want English as the official language. One of the problems we run up against is a lot of people don't realize that it isn't already the official language. They think it is already, but they don't know that we need to make it the official language. So we, what, what are the problems that come when, because we don't have, especially when, let's see, ballots are printed in how many different languages? We have an executive order that was issued under Bill Clinton that was never undone by George W. Bush and certainly not undone by Barack Obama that creates uh, burdens on the private sector as well as upon the government sector, what are the consequences of not having an official language? Well, I think you alluded to it in your in your opening remarks. I mean, we're we, we're creating a, this Tower of Babel situation, and it's going to lead to, I'm afraid, fragmentation and, and linguistic balkanization. You can look to countries like Canada that are divided over language. In fact, even Ukraine is divided over language, among all their other issues. But, that's a source of conflict for them. And in the eastern part of Ukraine, it's predominantly Russian-speaking, but in the western part, it's predominantly Ukrainian-speaking. So language can be a great divisive issue, and so having a common language is something that will bring us together. So having the ability to communicate, and I'm thinking, for example, of uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, a lot of people are not aware of Oklahoma City. Uh, people would not be surprised to find that, well, of course, there's a significant Hispanic community uh, mm -hmm. in Oklahoma City. Uh, there's no surprise to find a significant Hispanic community any place in the United States. There is also a significant Vietnamese community. That would surprise a lot of people. And it goes back to uh, different Vietnamese refugees that were brought by uh, Oklahoma City citizens who developed kind of a pipeline, as it were, uh, to bringing them to central Oklahoma. And so we have, obviously, a... a large English-speaking population. We have a Hispanic community. We have a Vietnamese community. Uh, you can go out west of town and there is a Czech-based community that has an annual Czech festival. 
you don't have a lot of Czech speakers there, but you do have that as part of the, uh, you know, history and uh, different areas of the state like that. But back to these that are fresher, the Hispanic and Vietnamese communities, how are they going to relate to each other if they don't have the commonality of both of them learning the English language? Well, that's a great question, and, and you know, this country, we used to have this melting pot tradition. You, know, you go back 100 years ago, people came here from all over the world, spoke many different languages, but the assumption was that when you come here, you learn English. English is the language of success, and, and today we've gotten away from that. We have this force of multiculturalism, bilingualism, you know, political correctness, call it what you want, but they're telling immigrants you don't have to learn English to succeed here, and really that's just going to harm them in, in the long run. Bob Vandervoort is the executive director of Pro English. Now, it, it doesn't happen in isolation that you have people pushing back against this extremely popular notion of having English as the uh, official language. Tell us about the forces that line up against it, the groups, the organizations, the institutions and those that find some benefit for themselves. Sure, well there's a lot of groups that are against it, unfortunately, uh, and many uh, groups named like La Raza, the ACLU, the SPLC, MALDEF, groups like that try to make it seem like this is a bigoted thing to do and that it's somehow a divisive thing to do when really they're doing the most harm to people because they're telling immigrants you don't have to know English and everyone should cater to you in your own language, which is not the American tradition. Now, how, how does pro-English go about its work? What, what are the actual things that you do trying to accomplish your objective to promote English? Primarily, we try to educate people about this issue, and we do that through research, we do that through policy papers, we have a quarterly newsletter that goes out to our subscribers, we have uh, email updates, very active web page. Uh, urge your listeners to check that out as well as Facebook and, and join us on Twitter. And uh, we just basically have been building over the years this strong grassroots community of activists who care about this issue. And the website again is? It's proenglish.org. Proenglish.org. Now, unfortunately, some people find themselves, they get in legal hot water over language, and you you get involved in some of the litigation that relates to that. That's correct. I think that's what makes us distinct as an organization. When people have problems, say they want people to speak English in the classroom or English in the workplace, a lot of times you have these busybody PC bureaucrats who want to say, oh, that's discriminatory, or you know, and, then, and they literally take people to court over this. We're involved in a case in Tucson, Arizona, representing a nursing student who was suspended because she asked for people in her classroom to speak English, and the nursing school administrator said, no, that's wrong, that's bigoted, you can't, you can't make that request. And she's got a nine-month suspension right now because of it. No, 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 wait, this is a teacher or a student? This is a student. There was a similar case in the news in Texas with a principal who was fired because she went on the PA system and told the students in the school they should speak English in the classroom. And we did reach out to her. She is currently represented by legal counsel, so we didn't get involved in that one. But uh, we are still involved in this case in Arizona. But, but aren't, aren't the schools, don't they have, for example, they have, uh, they have courses in you know, English as a second language, trying to take people that are here that are not native English speakers and to assist them in learning English so that they can assimilate, so that they can learn uh, the topic, whether it be math or history or geography, uh, science, whatever, biology, whatever it may be. We have courses to help people to learn English as a second language so that they can engage with all students, all teachers, on all topics. Isn't that supposed to be the official policy? Well, I, I agree wholeheartedly, Ernie. I think that, that these students should not have been in that classroom if they couldn't follow the lectures and had to translate for each other. These, the best thing for those students would have been to be in these English language classes and learning English instead of trying to take on difficult subjects such as the nursing and the science that's involved in all that. What, what does it do to the, both the quality and the pace, the, uh, the, the rapidity at which instruction can take place if somebody has to stop frequently during a classroom discussion and uh, try to engage in translation? 
Yes, and not only that, Terry was often assigned student projects in labs where she would be often the only English-speaking student in the group, so she was completely isolated. And this 40% of her grade was dependent on the, taking these student projects in group labs, and, and she was the only one who spoke English, and everyone else was communicating in a different language. Well, now I've been, you know, during my time as a member of Congress, I, I was engaged in a lot of international trips. Uh, I had meetings with uh, people in, in other nations where we often worked through a translator. Um, and uh, it, you could accomplish communication, but the pace of communication is so slow when you constantly have to go back and forth through a translator. And I can only imagine how much it slows down the education process. But again, that's, that's why you try to help people to learn English and go forth from there. Well, Bob, thank you for taking time to to join me on the show. And again, it's proenglish.com. Proenglish.org. Proenglish.org. That's the website of uh, Pro English. Bob Vandervoort is their executive director.